Hello and welcome to the Film Pulse Podcast. This is episode number 339. My name's Adam Patterson. With me today, we got Kevin Rakestraw. Hey, Kevin. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, it's going pretty well. Can't complain. Good. Good. So excited to talk about some movies. Good. This week on the show, we'll be talking about Joe Bagos' Bliss. We'll also be going over what we've been watching on the watch list, new releases in theaters, VOD and Blu-ray, all that fun stuff. Really, really quick housekeeping. No Ryan watches movie again this week. We're trying to wrangle him, get him, get him wrangled, but it hasn't happened yet. At this point, I feel like I'm just going to hold off on the housekeeping and saying that there's no Ryan and I'll do a housekeeping announcement when there is a new Ryan watches movie. Uh, yeah, that makes, that actually makes more sense. <laughs> Cause at this point it's not happening far more often than it is. So Correct. unfortunately we, we got back into like a little bit of a rhythm there and then he kind of died off again. Yeah. He's a, he's a busy guy. He's a busy guy wheeling and dealing. He's got all sorts of stuff going on. New Saved by the 90s dropped last week. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that yet, it is on a separate feed. So just uh, do a search on iTunes or your podcast platform, Spotify, whatever, for Saved by the 90s. We talked about mob movies, specifically ones released in September of 1990. That was a lot of fun. And I think that's all I have for housekeeping. Kevin, you're covering the Vancouver International Film Festival this week so check the site for lots of reviews from you on that very very exciting it's a rare occasion right there yeah i don't know if i'll do it again to be honest <laughs> just take it, out. I don't like it. it really took it out of you <laughs> I don't like it but the one the, the thing that solidified this in this process is that writing reviews is really really hard right but even more so than that just writing like an excerpt or a blurb. Oh yeah, is perhaps the worst thing. That's why I started having everyone do their own because I was doing for a, the longest time. I was coming up with the blurb, the little excerpt, and at some point I'm just like, I, I can't do it. I just can't do this anymore. I can't figure out because like a lot of times I it was I was writing an excerpt for a movie that I didn't even see, so it was really difficult. Imagine, yeah. So you're you're covering the Vancouver International Film Festival right now. I'm at the New York Film Festival. Um, there, there's not going to be a whole lot of coverage from that. Uh, there might be a couple things popping up on the site for that, um, but you can just follow my account on Twitter and see all the reviews that show up. I think we can dive into yeah. our review. We're talking about yeah. Joe Bagos's Bliss. This came out in limited release and on VOD this week. Now, if you are in, there are certain cities where this is actually screening in 35 millimeter. So, oh. yeah, if you're thinking about seeing this in the theater, check your listings and see if, it, if it's playing in 35 millimeter at any uh, locations near you. Okay. I, have a, I have a synopsis here. A brilliant painter facing the worst creative block of her life turns to anything she can to complete her masterpiece, spiraling into a hallucinatory hellscape of drugs, sex, and murder in the sleazy underbelly of Los Angeles. Kevin, what did you think of Bliss? Whew, this was uh, this was a little bit unrelenting. Kind of a whirlwind. Yeah. A whirlwind movie. It was. Um, I think I, I have my notes here. I just wrote as a bullet point, an assault on the senses. It is. It, they do. And it's kind of a mixed bag in that, in that way, for me, at least. There's a lot of aspects of it, that visual onslaught, the, you know, the, the audio onslaught, everything that's happening, you know, a lot of stylistic choices and stuff. A decent amount of it works for me. And then it seems like just an equal amount of stuff I found really just maybe annoying or agitating. Like mm -hmm. it's kind of a mixed bag. Yeah. Half and half. I think there's some stuff, there's some really good stuff going on there. Uh, number one, the, I think the, like the, the, the effects work here is pretty phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I was, I was on board with all of that. Right. Totally. In it. Some of the stylistic choices with camera angles and the spinning and the, the cutting, and some of that stuff that is a little bit much 
it's a very kinetic movie. It's a very, it, it is a little all over the place. For me, I would say uh, maybe, maybe 70, 30, uh, as far as okay. what worked to didn't work or 60, 40. I think, I think more than half of it worked for me. Uh, I, but I completely agree with you in that sometimes it did get a little annoying. I think, I think, in a movie like this where it is so overwhelming and it's just bombarding you nearly nonstop that oftentimes you can feel just completely exhausted when watching a movie like this. And yeah, that, that tends to happen a lot, especially, and, and there's, they even have at the beginning of the movie, there's uh, like a seizure warning that they have before the movie starts. <laughs> and this movie, it, like the strobing is very frequent, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, as someone who suffers from migraines, I, I'm very thankful that I, it didn't trigger one for me. But there's a lot of strobing and flashing lights in this. Yes, which I thought was a, a little bit. Yeah. yeah, it was a little. It felt like a crutch sometimes. It was a little. It was just a little too much for me. I, I just wish that they dialed that back, but. That being said, I totally understand the style that that uh, Begos was going for with this, and I think for the most part that style worked very well. I mean, the the fact that this was shot on sixteen millimeter, I think, helped it tremendously to sort of nail that look, that vibe. And overall, I yeah. think I, I think it was uh, really well shot. Yeah, I think again, to me, it just came down to it was it was a little bit too frequent. Some of these things where it, it kind of felt like his, his bag of tricks. There's not a whole lot in there. He kept going back to the kind of the same things. Yeah. There were like, more... I did, but I have to say, I, I do really appreciate the little, you know, the warning at the beginning kind of, you know, gave me an idea of what to expect. And it's definitely warranted hundred percent warranted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> with the stroke. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, like he, he did, there's a lot of camera tricks in here, a lot of crazy movements and a lot of crazy framing and stuff like that. And he does reuse some of them. Mm, I don't know if too many times, maybe, maybe one too many times. Like there's a lot of scenes of like the, so the main character played by Dora Madison, like when she gets, when she starts to get really starts to go overboard uh there's lots of scenes of her like falling over like on the ground and the camera sort of follows her down and then it follows her back up i don't know if they use that same camera rig that they do in um requiem for a dream the, the one where the camera's strapped to the the actor no oh, yeah yeah it's kind of focused in on him yeah i forget there's like a name for that but i forget what it is they they he uses that uh quite a bit and it's just uh Maybe some of it is a bit too much, but I think overall, man, I just loved the griminess of this movie. Just the, just how sleazy and dirty it was. I, I was just I, fully invested in that. I do find it rather interesting in, I mean, the synopsis, okay, it makes sense. But in, in the actual movie itself, that there's not once is the word vampire mentioned. Nope. None. Have you seen uh, the Abel Ferrara movie, The Addiction? No, I do want to see that though. This is I basically it's this is basically, basically the, the it's this is the addiction. Oh. I mean, it, it's pretty much the exact same. Like the 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 plot beats feel very similar. It's really reminiscent of the addiction. Gotcha. So if if you were it. it same kind of like gritty, grimy style, lots of like gross looking sets, you know, everything's dirty. Yeah, everything is dirty. It's just a lot of, you no know, one's cleaning and it's just disgusting. Yeah. Lots of fluids. It's clean. Lots of fluids. Clean once in a while. Just mop. <laughs> gross. Something. Grungy clubs, bars, and lots Every, of yeah. gross bathrooms. Disgusting. <laughs> Disgusting. Now, for as much as I talked about like the the visuals and which I don't think the visuals really got to me. I think it was more of some of like the editing style. It is, you know, a little bit too familiar with some of the like when she's when she's kind of losing her grip, the old cutting. Yeah, you, know, you gotta throw in like hundred and twenty cuts 
in mm-hmm. a matter of like a minute and a half. Yeah. But the the thing that got me the most, and I don't know if it's how you felt about this, but and I don't necessarily think it's like the actual performance from Nora Madison, but and I don't know if it was in like the actual screenplay itself or it was something they added like in takes, what it may be, but the, and this is where you're coming from me, but the use of the F word, saying <laughs> fucking like every single sentence, it just, it did not feel natural at all. It just, it felt like they're just trying to shove in as many fuckings as possible. And the way she would deliver it just felt really unnatural. And it was a bit much. It's so funny you mentioned that because there's one scene where she is like frantically trying to call her friend. I believe it's uh, Courtney that she's trying to call played by true Collins. And it, she leaves her like a voicemail and she throws in fuck like every other word. And i I also f- found that to be, it felt really weird and unnatural and out of place. So I, I totally, <laughs> I see where you're coming from with this. It felt very odd. <laughs> Now, yeah, and, it just it felt weird, like they were going for something. And, and again, I don't know if it, it's not really necessarily no, uh, Dora Madison's fault because, uh, you know, they telling her to do it, but it just it didn't. I wasn't buying it coming out of her mouth. Yeah, it was really weird. Word, but it, it's funny though because I was thinking about this scene, and if you were ever in a situation where you're at a bar or at a party or something and two people start to get into it, you know, they they might be drunk or stoned or something and they uh, start to have an altercation with one another. That's often how they, people talk, you know, where they just start saying fuck. Oh, like all the time. So I think on the script level, it maybe it did work in that, but just for, for whatever reason, yeah, the execution of that's that's, scene didn't yeah didn't mm-hmm. necessarily yeah. land i don't know have you ever been in a situation where you saw two people in an altercation and they're like fucked up and they're just like what the fuck man you fucking doing this to me what the fuck man i saw you fucking <laughs> touching her dude no thank god <laughs> i don't go out though uh, <laughs> I'm I, I, that in new york city i imagine that there's probably far more opportunities to see yeah that. i've seen that that those altercations like on the street outside of the bar so you have uh jeremy gardner in there is clive he's the boyfriend of desi who's the the dora madison character it took entirely too long for him to, to him to find out what's going on well it didn't seem like they were very close like it seemed like maybe they were sort of just fuck buddies or something or just you know f- Friends, yeah, it was, it friends was kind of odd, I, for the majority of that movie, I did not know that they were together. Yeah, I don't know if they were like official because it, it seemed like they he would just kind of just seemed like they were fuck buddies. Yeah, gotcha. and, and then you have Graham Skipper in there as uh, the the drug dealer Hadrian. <laughs> Hadrian. Hadrian. <laughs> <Adrian>. <laughs> Uh, never, never seen that before. Yeah, that's a new one. That's a new one. Uh, Graham Skipper, I, you probably know from a lot of Joe Bagos' stuff. Maybe all of his movies. I do enjoy the, the the first time that Desi goes over to get the drugs. She takes a bomb. <laughs> he leaves her in the room. Never checks on her ever again. She's well, in there for like nine hours. Well, it's also funny because he says that he's going to stay in there with her. Yeah. <laughs> he immediately leaves. Uh, Graham, Graham Skipper in this reminds me of um, Macon Blair for some reason. I just get Macon Blair vibes from him in, in this. And he's good too. And then you also have maybe one of the weirdest <laughs> casting choices, George Wendt. Mm-hmm. George Wendt yeah. is in this. I I'm, I can't wrap my head around that, but there he, there he was. There was Norm. And then and then to make it even weirder is the majority of the time he's arguing with Abraham Van Ruby from yeah. Parker Lewis Can't Lose, which 
I don't, <laughs> I, I don't know how they made that happen, but they did. Yeah, uh, really, really strange. So, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, overall, <laughs> overall, I had fun with this movie. I thought that it's certainly not for everyone. I think that a lot of people will be put off by just how overwhelming it it is, but certainly that's by design. And for me, it oh, yeah. it, it just. For me, it it worked. I thought that there were... And and just to go back to what you were saying about the effects work, I thought all the effects work was really well done. I mean, this is 100% practical effects, and boy, is there a lot of blood in this movie. (laughs) There's a lot. so much. There is a lot of blood and gore. Like when she... uh, I'm not going to say who it is, but she stabs someone in the eye and then like drinks the the fluid that's coming out of their eye uh, hole yeah just she, like, just, she she taps that face yeah and the blood just starts pouring out and there is there's a person at one point that also gets their their neck cracked open like a pez dispenser yep yep and that shit just gushes mm-hmm. there's so much blood it's so ridiculous and then there's also someone who essentially gets what do they call that uh is it called gloved? Like when you're all the skin gets pulled off of your hand. There's a term for that. I but didn't, I didn't know that there's a term for that. Yeah. Wow. That happens to somebody too. So it's a uh, pretty gory. It's a pretty intense movie. There's also a part of me that really appreciates that there's the whole vampire thing. They don't really explain any of it. Like the ending of this movie makes no sense to me whatsoever and like i don't understand the logistics of these creatures or anything but i'm also kind of happy that they didn't spend any time trying to explain any of that no because i think if they did that would make it too real and i think that a lot of it is supposed to be strictly metaphor where we don't even know we don't even know what's happening if it's real or not. Like we don't even know if it this what's mm. happening is all in her head or what. Yeah, which he does a bad job of that. I will say that if that's what he's going for, he does a terrible job of that because it's definitely real. Like it <laughs> doesn't make sense if it's not. If it's in her head, it doesn't make any sense. Not all of it, certainly, but some some things that happen, you're just like. Did that, did that actually happen? Like, is she, cause at first you don't know if she's like just fantasizing about this, if, if this is her trying to hold back the urges or if it, if it really happens because like, like she says, she blacks out during the whole thing. So she doesn't even know what's going on. Yeah. But we don't, we don't black out. We see it. We know what's going on. A lot of carnage, a lot of carnage happening. Was a whole lot of carnage. She's whole just trying lot. to be. She's just trying to get she's over. Trying her, to get that paint done. Yeah, she's she's trying, trying to get that paint done. Get over her painter's block. Which, which I do have to find. It was. I mean, this is real nitpick and stuff here, but I do love the fact that the size of her canvas that she can't really reach the very top of it, but she never once uses like a step stool or anything. She's just trying like on her tippy. She's just like on her tippy toes trying to reach. Like you can't paint like that. Come on, maybe that's why you're having issues. <laughs> maybe she had a step you can't stool. Can't see what you're painting. <laughs> she, maybe she had a step stool off frame or something, and she—that's what she did. I don't know. It did also lose me a little bit with the the music video thing at the end with the dancing. Like that was just. Hmm. I didn't mind that it. Felt, yeah. That I, was, nah. I didn't cut all that out of it. Didn't really mind it. Uh, all right. Any final thoughts on Bliss? No, I think I'm good. All right. We do have a full review, written review for this up on the site. Blake uh, covered it at Cinepocalypse, I think I think it was earlier this year. And uh, he, he really liked it. I think he gave it like an 8 out of 10 or something like that. Uh, so you can read our uh, full review there. Let's go ahead and give this a score. I think I'm sitting at like a 7 out of 10 on Bliss. Okay. I think I'm like a five and a half, maybe a six. All right. There you have it. Again, that is in theaters and on VOD right now. Uh, all right. Let's move on and talk about someone watching. Uh, I think it's you, 
Kevin? Well, I, I, as you said at the top of the show, covering that Vancouver International Film Festival. This. Which, uh, yeah, this. The, uh, the future present section, to be precise. And a couple of these, a couple of these titles just played a tiff. So Murmur being one of them, that played a tiff. This is directed by Heather Young. This is, I was, I was really impressed with this movie. Adam, I think this, you could enjoy this one. Very dog centric, a lot of dogs in this movie. And the whole thing essentially is this woman, she got uh, hit with a DWI. So she loses her life. She has to do community service, which she ends up working at the, at the, like the local animal shelter, right? This elderly dog is up for euthanasia. And she's like, no, I'm going to take him home. This is my dog now. And it essentially, you know, kind of helps her out through what she's going through. Because what she's also going through is that her, her daughter won't essentially talk to her. She can never get a hold of her. She's, she's pretty much just completely alone at home. So now she has this old dog, Charlie, to help her out. And it kind of, it works in the beginning stages. Kind of helps her out. She stops drinking which apparently in Canada, you're allowed to have alcohol in your house, even though you got busted for DWI. I don't know how Canada works in that angle. But so she, you know, she starts bettering her life, right? But the problem is she just starts getting a bunch of animals, right? Anytime an animal's coming up for euthanasia, she just kind of sneaks it out. A new dog comes in, she sneaks that one out. She gets a gerbil. She gets all sorts of animals, which, I mean, drawn drawing that connection there that she has a kind of an issue with moderation and uh, things kind of get out of hand. And uh, it kind of goes to a surprising place at the end that I wasn't quite uh, expecting. But this is a film that's very kind of like uh, very formalist with its, its approach, right? It's just, it's pretty matter of fact. It's mostly just a static camera most of the time. Uh, it's somewhat slow, but I think it, in what it's dealing with, it works. It works rather well. I can't really imagine it being shot in any other way and working as as well as it does here. And that's murmur. That's this definitely. This is definitely on my radar now. Uh, all right. So I, I couple. I, I covered a couple movies that were at Fantastic Fest this year. One of them being a movie called Coco di Coco da. Uh, this is directed by Johannes. Nyholm and uh, man this movie I I guess I could see why some people would find this movie to be somewhat compelling it's it's about a couple who goes on vacation and they are at this like resort and they eat some some mussels and the, the wife gets very sick from the muscles. She has an allergic reaction and she ends up in the hospital and Ooh. the, they think that she, she's fine, but they learn that their daughter also ate some of the muscles and the daughter seems okay. But the next morning when they wake up in the hospital, the daughter's dead and Ooh. she, so she died overnight. So we jump ahead three years later and the couple is, their marriage is on the verge of ending, you know, a, a lot of times when a couple goes through such a traumatic event, the marriage doesn't last through something like that. And that, that's sort of what's happening here. They're about to end it and they decide to go on this vacation as sort of a last ditch effort to rekindle their love for one another. Mm. So they go camping and... While they're camping, a trio of carnies come and humiliate them and kill them. And wow. yeah, and and that's not even a spoiler. What ha what happens then is that there's a time loop where they oh, af af after they get killed, it loops back and they're back in the tent again. And it seems like only the husband can is aware of this time loop. Now, the problem with the movie, when you have a time loop movie, it runs the risk of becoming repetitive. You know, when you repeat the same sequence of scenes over and over again verbatim, it 
could become repetitive. And a lot of movies like Groundhog Day or Happy Death Day or a lot of the other ones, they, they sort of help circumvent that from happening by introducing new things every time it loops. And the main characters are compelling and they do different things to try to break the loop. But, and also most of these movies, it's like a full day before it loops, right? Mm -hmm. This movie, the loop's like 10 minutes long. So, (laughs) so it's a very short loop. And for like the first four loops, it's pretty much the same thing that happens. So it's, it's sort of already kind of grating, but What makes it so much worse is that this couple, this couple is so unlikable that you just don't care what happens to them at all. And the husband is so inept at everything that he attempts to do. Like, he's such an idiot that everything about this movie is so frustrating. It's weird. They introduce a lot of, like, weird things into it. I mean, if you see the the poster for it, you're just like, oh, that's going to be kind of a weird, like, absurdist movie. And none of that stuff really worked. And I just could not get into this movie. I was so glad it was over. So I would not recommend Coco D. Coco Da. I do have a written review for this up on the site if you're interested. Uh, another thing I played at Tiff, now playing at Ziff. Tiff and Ziff. Fine. <laughs> Tiff it and Viff it. Uh, <laughs> uh, the 20th Century. This is Matthew Rankin directed. <laughs> I guess it's a, it's a biopic of William Lyon Mackenzie King, who happened to be Canada's 10th Prime Minister. But um, a lot of creative license with this, I can only assume. But I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he was into a lot of weird stuff. I don't know a whole lot about Canada. But one of the things is that in this, like the, the thing that he needs to overcome in order to, to become prime minister is he's got to get over his fetish for boots. Apparently he has this thing for boots, right? And they got to be like used boots. Or he goes to Winnipeg and buys used boots and then brings them back. And he just shoves them in his face and just furiously masturbates. Yeah. And that's like, it they, they takes over his whole life. It just fucking wrecks him. So he's got to get over that, which they end up like hooking up some sort of like shocking device with an alarm on his genitalia. And there's just a whole bunch of other stuff going on here to the point where I wish this happened more often, to be quite honest. I mean, we've had how many movies in the history of movies that like whitewash history, right? And just make them absolutely ridiculous it it would be fun to see something like this catch on we would just make up a bunch of shit about someone <laughs> do you know who Mackenzie king is do you know who the 10th prime minister of canada is no no just make up a whole bunch of shit about him who cares he's dead you can do whatever you want <laughs> but not only that like not only is it absurd and you know it's ridiculous and it's it's pretty damn funny but like visually this movie is, I mean, really, really interesting. I don't, I don't know the last time I've seen a movie like this where almost every single set is constructed. It's a bunch of pyramids. It's really difficult to explain, honestly. Uh, there's a lot of animation used, but it's not, it's not, when I say animation, you probably have something in your mind that, that you envision. It's not that. I can guarantee you it's not that it's just, I mean, you got to see it to believe it. It's just absolutely ridiculous. And it's so goddamn entertaining. This is another one that uh, is on my (laughs) radar. (laughs) Like the whole thing at the end is like two of them. There's down to two prime ministers or two candidates for prime minister. And it, what it ends up being is a, a speed skating through a labyrinth. And you got to, you know, put a, your flag in an area to win. And which someone almost gets it, but a narwhal takes them out. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> Those pesky narwhals. <laughs> They'll fucking get you every time. You got to watch out. 
And that's the twentieth century. Yeah, definitely gonna give that a look at some point whenever it comes out. And I mean, uh, look at look it up too. I mean, just to, to see a couple of stills of this bad boy. Yeah, uh, that's, it's like that all the time. Yeah, you have a written review for this up on the site right now, so give give that a yeah. look. Uh, I saw a porno this week. This is probably one of the only times that I'll say this on this show that I watched a porno. <laughs> this is uh, called Angela is the Fireworks Woman, and it was released in 1975, directed by Wes Craven, and that's why I watched it. Uh, okay. And, you sure, know, it's, it's sure. like one of those deals where I I heard that, like, he – so he made – he directed this porn movie after – it was after uh, – Last House on the Left. So he had already like directed a legit film by, by this point. And so I was just kind of curious. And I didn't, for some reason, I didn't expect it to be like a hardcore porn because I've seen other directors who did porn and it's always been kind of like softcore stuff. But no, this is like, yeah. this is just a straight up hardcore porn. Um, to be clear, I just fast forwarded through all the porn parts. But uh, because they they were like kind of scuzzy '70s style porn, so it was very unpleasant to watch, for the most part. <laughs> anyway, the, the the so the premise of this is that it's about this woman who is in love with her brother, and they oh end, boy, yeah, and they so they end up like sleeping together, and I, th- I think they sleep together multiple times, although it's not really clear what is real and what's kind of a fantasy, but. It, it definitely happens at least once and the brother freaks out and ends up becoming a priest. And so she's just, so most, most of the movie is just her trying to convince him to leave the priesthood and have the two of them run away together and just live, live their life. Um, but she's very, she's unsuccessful and the devil approaches her and the devil is actually played by Wes Craven and he, she strikes a deal with the devil to get her brother to want to leave the priesthood and, and get with her. It's, uh, it's, it's not good, but it's really interesting to see Wes, the, the mind of Wes Craven directing a porno (laughs) because there's definitely shades of, his his style in this even though it's an early early movie of his and it's it's a porno and it, he he doesn't go by his real name in this either he goes by abe snake That's, i was really hoping that you would say the name because i would have been yeah i would i really would have been confused if you did not say that name abe snake wow yeah. what a name so anyway I mean, you have to pick one so I, I can't recommend this. I'm, I wanted to, so my goal is to like f- watch all of Wes Craven's filmography this, this Halloween. And so I'm just starting at the beginning and just going to try to fill, fill it in. And, mm-hmm. uh, this is, this was on the list. So yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, it took me a long time to find it too, but there's there, I found it on uh, streaming on some website. Oh, I'm sure you did. <laughs> did you just throw that computer out is that why you're a windows guy now there was definitely a, a private browsing window going on during that <laughs> that's interesting that's perfect because then i can segue right into to my next movie which is a west Craven movie and that's a i rewatched scream oh because that bad boy is on netflix you can watch it on netflix classic one, one of the few horror movies you can watch on netflix there's not a whole lot on there. Uh, my wife had never seen this, and hell, it's been ages since I've seen it. And uh, it, it holds up pretty well, I gotta say. It's pretty good. Mm-hmm. I agree. Still pretty, uh, still pretty good. Uh, now, I did one of the things that I remembered going into this viewing, because I, did, you know, I don't remember a whole lot. I remembered who the killers were. I remember certain aspects of it, things that play out, and everything. But the one thing that I remembered that I wasn't 100% sure if that if it was that way was that Matthew Lillard's performance in this is just, it's really fucking annoying. 
And it turns out that, yes, it still is. It's still really annoying. Yeah, he's really he's, over the top. He's, oh, he's trying so hard throughout. But, man, some of this stuff is just, she tries to crawl out of the cat door. When she bites it, when the Rose McGowan's character gets killed by the the garage door, mm-hmm. which I don't yeah. think a garage door could do that. I think it would just Pretty stop. Pretty sure it yeah. can't. It, it, I think it would yeah. just stop open. It can't. It, it can't hold that much that much weight. But man, what was she thinking? Man. Pretty great. It's a nice. I I gotta say, it's a pretty pretty great mix of comedy and and uh, an actual horror elements in there. Yeah, I think that this is, is it, it's this is a classic. It really is. Yeah, I don't remember it being, you know, that that far into comedy. I thought it was more of a, you know, just kind of lightly tongue in cheek, but definitely far more comedy than I remembered. Yeah, it was sort of like. Wes Craven doubling down on what he the 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 meta humor that he sort of dipped his toes into in the new nightmare, which is also really yeah. great. Yeah, I think I might have to take a look at that one then. I think New Nightmare came that was what he made right before Scream. But uh okay. yeah. Right. I'm excited. <laughs> I, I think uh in during my Craven filmography. I'll probably be rewatching some of some of these that like I haven't seen New Nightmare in years, so I'll be rewatching that. Yeah, uh, I saw a horror movie called In the Tall Grass. This comes out on Netflix Friday, I believe. Um, this is directed by Vincenzo Natale. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it features Patrick Wilson. Uh, and it basically, so it's based on a, a Stephen King short story that was uh, co-written by Joe Hill. And it involves this uh, brother and sister who are driving, they're on a road trip. They're heading out to San Diego, I'm going to say. And um, they stop at this like kind of dusty old um road they're they're going down this country road in the middle of america and uh the the sister is pregnant and so they have to pull over because she thinks she's going to be sick and while they're pulled over they hear a young boy calling for help in this like giant field of tall grass that's that's right next to the road and they get out they call to him he's he keeps calling for help so they go into the grass to try to find the kid and, and help him out. And they get lost in the grass too. And it turns out that there's something supernatural happening in this giant field of tall grass where like they even standing still their position within the field will move. So they, so they never know exactly where they are or how to get out. And they discover that they're not the only ones in there. There's the boy of course. And then there's, the the mom and the the dad of the boy that who are also lost in the grass starts off really i mean the premise alone is like intriguing right like you're like what's going on here this tall grass just sucks people up what's what's happening um of course so for the bulk of the movie it remains a really really fascinating and, and a really good horror story but Towards the end, I would say within the final act, it really kind of just lost me. After all the cards were on the table and after the you know reveal happened and everything, it just kind of fizzled out for me a little bit. I am actually reading the short story because I just want to see if it plays out differently, but I'm only like halfway through right now. So I don't know, maybe a light recommend, I would say, for In the Tall Grass. There's some really good visuals. There's a lot of these really cool overhead, like, almost drone looking shots of the grass. And it just looks really, really cool. So there's a lot of cool imagery in here. And okay. I mean, that's, yeah. that's sort of Vin- Vincenzo Natale is always kind of good with interesting visual imagery. And it's so funny because I, f- I totally forgot that he directed this. And while I was watching it, I'm like, Oh man, I'm getting kind of a cube vibe from this, the way, how, how they seem to move around like on their own. And then I realized that, he directed it and I'm like, Oh, okay. All right. There you go. That all makes sense now. Yeah. I mean, that's really the only, the only linking 
the, the, the only connective tissue to cube. There's not like traps or anything. Oh man. Yeah. I'd like to see some grass traps. That's all I got. I'm done. Okay. Uh, I got a couple more. I can just rattle off here very quickly. I saw memory, the origins of alien. This is uh, directed by Alexander O. Philip. He's the same guy who did that uh, documentary on the a psycho shower scene where he created a whole movie about the shower scene in psycho. So I was, okay. kind of, I was kind of hoping when, when I heard that he was working on this, which was all about the inspiration behind the movie alien, that if this would be like a super deep dive into, into alien and it's, mm-hmm. it's not really, uh, it's sort of just, I don't want to say it's surface level because it definitely goes deeper than that, but it kind of just highlights all of the various uh, artists and uh, TV shows and movies that, that inspired the movie alien. And a lot of it, the bulk of it, it revolves around Dan O'Bannon's inspiration when he was working on the script for alien. Uh, they do t- touch on like Jodorowsky's Dune and how like a lot of the designs and things that were in Alien came from Jodorowsky's Dune. But of course, there's like a whole documentary about that that you can watch. Uh, so there's there's a lot of if you're not super familiar with the backstory of Alien, I think that this is a really entertaining, super well made watch. The one thing that I will say is the the visuals are really well done in this. If you're okay. if you're like me, who is already kind of obsessed with the Alien movies, there's not a lot here that is like new. Now there there are some like archival scenes and footage and stuff that are that are have never been seen before. So there there's a little bit of stuff in here that's completely new. But as far Mm -hmm. as like the actual elements that inspired the movie, not a lot of big revelations to be had. I also saw In the Shadow of the Moon, which was on the the Netflix movie that released this past weekend. This is sort of this directed by Jim Mickle. And it's sort of this kind of sci-fi police procedural where there's a, a killer, a serial killer who's going around Philadelphia in 1988, killing seemingly random people by injecting them with something that basically makes their brain melt. And so it stars Boyd Holbrook as this cop who's trying to track down this killer. And it, they, the, the killer, he through through a, a confrontation, the killer seems to fall in front of a train and die. But then nine years later, she comes back and starts killing again. Nine years later, again, comes back, starts killing, so on and so on. And, you know, there's some, there's some interesting stuff here. I thought it was fine. It, again, was something that started losing me the further it progressed and, and the more truths came to light. I was just like, oh, that's not, not as interesting as I was kind of hoping it would be. And it sort mm, of reminded yeah. me... It reminded me a lot of the movie Predestination. I thought the Predestination actually did this this concept in, in a much more fascinating way. And like the twist, the, the various twists that occurred in Predestination, while I saw them coming, they were still a lot more clever than what happens in, in The Shadow of the Moon, which is was a twist that I also saw coming pretty early on. So anyway, that's... Maybe a light recommend just because it's on Netflix. It feels like it is suited for Netflix. You know what I you know, it's a light recommend based on the effort, the amount of effort that you have to put in. Yeah. I mean you do get okay. to you, you do get to see Dexter or Michael C. Hall with a really awesome Philly accent in it. So See, I I'm almost tempted to just pop it pop it on. Yeah. Get to that part and then turn it off. It happens pretty early, so you don't you don't have to watch too much of it to to hear the sweet Dexter accent, sweet Philly Dexter accent. Nice. 
Uh, that's that's pretty much all I'll mention. I did see the Maradona documentary, but I just don't have a whole lot to say about it. it it's just a profile of Diego Maradona. If you're uh, a soccer fan, it's a very, very well-made documentary. It's by the guy who did Senna, I believe. And uh, so it's oh, yeah, yeah. super high quality. I mean, man, production quality. It's like all archival footage, but just the way he puts it together and just the the polish that it has it's it's really good and and it's like sort of a talking head doc it's mostly just maradona talking but one thing that he does that i really liked was that there's no cutaways to like interview footage it's all done in voiceover so he keeps almost all of the whole movie is nothing but archival footage of the matches that it, that they play that he played and like home movie footage and stuff like that. So it's nothing but footage, which was awesome. So if you're, if you're a soccer fan, if you're into, if you want to learn more about Diego Maradona, who is, I think arguably one of the greatest soccer players that ever lived, you, you can check that out. It's on HBO on uh, today as this releases. All right, let's take a look at what we have in theaters this week. Got a biggie. Joker. We got Joker coming out. Joker. Are you ready? I'm not I'm not ready for it to enter the the pop culture zeitgeist. Like I'm not I'm not ready for it to be everywhere. Too late. Too late. I'm I'm kinda of hoping that the, the quicker it enters, the the quicker it'll leave. We can move on to something else, hopefully. I mean, I'm going to go see it. I'm anxious to see it. But I also, at the same time, from what little I read about, you know, from people on Twitter and from uh, the, the trailers, I feel like I know, like, I feel like I've seen this movie before. It feels very much like, I mean, I remember when I first saw the, the very first trailer, I was like, oh, man, that looks like some kind of mashup between King of Comedy and Taxi Driver. And... That's pretty much what mm -hmm. everybody's saying. So I feel like I already know exactly w how this movie is going to play out. You know, it's going to be like, let's see, it's it's just over two hours. So it's going to be like an hour and 45 minutes of Joaquin Phoenix's character getting shit on and then him finally losing it and putting on the makeup and like murdering mayhem people or something. At the yeah. End. yeah bunch of mayhem and I, then roll credits that's that's my theory behind it i guess we'll we'll see but we'll find out i mean i like the look of it just from again judging from the trailer i'm kind of digging the the look the visual style but we'll see I'm, I'm anxious are you i take it you're not you're not interested at all oh i'm i'm definitely seeing it oh you, you are. have no idea how excited my wife is for this movie Okay. All right. She's losing it. Good. I, 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 I'm hoping that it won't let us down. Also in theaters this week, we have Lucy in the Sky. This is the one with Natalie Portman, where she plays an astronaut. I think that the uh, sort of the premise is that she does this big space flight. She comes home, and she has a really hard time acclimating to the world on the ground after she experienced something as incredible as being in space yeah <laughs> i i don't know what it is but everything i've seen about this movie just it looks like the most uninteresting thing i agree i'm not i'm not too excited for it all right also we have gregory's girl uh, we have pain and glory this is the um the new the new one from uh, pedro amodovar I, oh, okay. yeah, I, this looks, I might give this a I look. I didn't know that was, I didn't know that was coming out already. Yeah, I think it's probably, I'm sure it's limited. I, it's playing oh, at sure. the, I know it's playing at the New York Film Festival this week. Uh, we have Pretenders coming out, Memory, The Origins of Alien. We got Sometimes Always Never, which looks like it might be about Scrabble or yeah, the grieving what? Scrabble enthusiast. What? <laughs> yeah. Is, oh wait, grieving. Yep. 
Just the boy, uh, but Bill Nye? Yeah, Bill Nye. It helps the father reconnect with a missing son. It's a detective fantasy family. <laughs> There's <laughs> a lot going on. In this <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Genre mashup. Holy shit. Just shove them all in there. See what happens. <laughs> We also have Delili in Paris, which is an animated film. On VOD this week, we have, on Tuesday, we have Eco-Terrorist, Battle for Our Planet. That's a documentary. We have Diego Maradona. This is on HBO. Uh, Karma. This looks like a horror movie. We got Once Upon a Time in Deadwood. This is the one with Robert Bronzy, the... The uh, um, the Charles Bronson lookalike guy. That I mean, has this ever been? Is it, has this ever happened before? Where a person has developed an acting career just because he looks like another actor, and that's why he's cast. I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I not not to. No, it can't be. It's got to be the first. Yeah, I just. It's incredible to me. Like, this guy is getting work. Now, I have not seen any of his movies. He, he may be a very good actor. I don't know. But clearly, the reason that he's getting roles is because he looks exactly like Charles Bronson, and that's what they sell these movies on. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could say Hollywood's been doing that forever. I guess they so. Always get, but it is a, just a touch different in my eyes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's that's coming out. Replace is coming out. This is uh, looks to be some kind of. It's a horror movie, but it looks like maybe sci-fi horror. Barbara Crampton's in there. Right. We have on the third, Nighthawks coming out, and then oh, yeah, and then on the fourth we have Rogue Warfare, Semper Fi. We got uh, the parts you lose. Which is the Frankie? Is that the no? That's not the Frankie Muniz one. That's uh, Aaron Paul, isn't that? We have Delili in Paris, in the Tall Grass, Memory: The Origins of Alien, and then on Blu-ray this week we have a new 4K release of The Shining from 1980. I heard good things about this 4K release. Okay, it might be time for me to get a 4K TV this year. I'm I'm thinking about it. My my TV's starting to act a little, a little funny. Just starting to go on a fritz. It is. There's something weird going on. It's like muting itself automatically, and I have like a, an external sound system, but it's telling yeah. it to mute randomly, and it's also switching inputs randomly. So that's becoming yeah. a new. Oh, your TV, your TV's on it. It's becoming it's a nuisance. On a TV. It is becoming it's a nuisance. On a TV. I have no issues with my TV whatsoever. Never have. That 780p, 32 inches, just the fucking workhorse. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, my, my TV has lasted a very long time, and it still mostly works okay. I mean, those problems that I mentioned, <laughs> well, those problems that I mentioned, it's not like they're happening all the time. You know, like, it's happened a few times over the last yeah. several weeks, so it's not enough like if it was doing it all the time, like I couldn't get through a TV show or a movie without it happening, then then I would definitely do something about it. But I would hope so. That would be odd that if it was doing it all the time, you're just like I just gotta. I just live with through. it. <laughs> <laughs> this is it now. This is just how I deal with my TV watching. <laughs> um, Gremlins comes out uh, on 4K as well, as does Pan's oh, Labyrinth. Man. I need- I need to rewatch that Gremlins. Me too. It's way too long. Might be a Christmas watch. It's a good Christmas movie. Yeah, I'm definitely watching that before the end of the year. Uh, Chernobyl is coming out on Blu-ray. If you haven't seen Chernobyl yet, oh my god, pause this and watch the whole series of Chernobyl, then come back. Because does that go for me too? Uh, not for you, but after the show okay. ends, then then you you go watch Chernobyl. You'll okay. you I watched one episode. Oh my god. I just never I never circled back to it. I was it, like, this is all right. It's so good. You gotta you gotta finish it. I mean it's pretty short. It's not super long. It's so Are good. Are you sure? I think it's like eight episodes, eight or ten episodes. That's the whole thing. Yeah, of like an hour each. 
Well, it's a it's mini series. It's a mini series. I mean, it's it's, it's as long. It's five as, and a half hours. It's TV's as, getting out of hand. Stop it. It's as long as a typical season of a show. But this ends. Yeah, which they're getting way too long. Mm. I'm starting to get pissed. TV pissing me off lately. Just I'm gonna throw that out there. Just a bunch of fucking dicking around and doing nothing. Well, not hours. not Chernobyl. Trust me, not Chernobyl. Oh. All right. Every episode is just it's like better than the last. It's so good. I I'm, disagree. I'm hopping right on that goddamn train. Okay. All right. Coming for you. I implore you to do that. Uh, okay. We also have the the prey from 1984. This is an Arrow release. I hope to see this. I want to. I want to get this. I've never seen this movie before, and I'm intrigued. We got Wanted, Dead or Alive from 1986, starring Rutger Hauer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Adams Family from 1991 getting a new Blu-ray release, and I think I don't see it on here, but I think Adams Family Values is also coming out, and it's going to be the first time that's on Blu-ray. Spider-Man Far From Home is coming out on Blu-ray. The Gangster, The Cop, The Devil. I would recommend uh, that one for sure. Yeah. Jarhead. F- l- Jarhead Law. <laughs> <laughs> Jarhead Law of Return is coming out. That's the fourth entry in the Jarhead series. And there's the all. Fourth? Yeah, the fourth one. Can you believe, you know, when you see, you saw the first Jarhead, right? Uh, I'm not sure. What? Maybe. Yeah, I don't remember it at all. I saw the first one in theaters, and I really liked it, by the way. But when you see that movie, you would never in a million years think, oh, yeah, this is going to be a franchise. This is They're going to make a whole bunch of these. They set this up perfectly for a sequel. It's literally, <laughs> It's literally a movie about... Marines deployed and they don't do anything at all ever. Like it's about the boredom of war. And I don't understand how they somehow turn that into a franchise, but at any rate, not, not, not only that, but the, the fourth installment of it. Right. Sorry. Devin Sawa. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, yeah. I kind of want to watch one of the sequels just to see what it's about. <laughs> But, Get to the fourth. Oh, I should. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I don't think any of them have to do with each other. Like I think they're all separate. But at any rate, there's a uh, a box set coming out, four movie collection of Jarhead, so I can get wow. them all. Get them all. Holy Just mackerel! Take the weekend, binge Jarhead, one through four. <laughs> that sounds like the worst weekend. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, it does. Uh, the proposal is also coming out, and that's pretty much it. Any criterions this week? Uh, no, they seem to be taking the week off. Taking the week off. All right, good for them. They need a they need a yeah. little break. They're getting they're getting ready for that Godzilla release. Exactly. Got to pour all your efforts in that one. Yep. All right, I think that's going to do it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. You can send us your questions and topics to podcast at filmpulse.net. You can follow us on Twitter at filmpulse.net and at filmpulsekevin. And if you have a minute, consider reviewing us on your podcast platform of choice. For Kevin Rakestraw, my name is Adam Patterson. We'll see you next week.